Well, hello everyone and welcome to another Ask the Expert here from GBH. I'm Chris Voss. I'm going to be your host this afternoon. I'm the afternoon host for Classical Radio Boston. And today we're going to be learning about Celtic and O'Donovan Christmas traditions with the one and only Brian O'Donovan and his wife, Lindsay. Thank you so much for joining us today, especially thank you to our Leadership Circle and Ralph Lowell Society members. We really appreciate your continued generous support of everything that GBH does. Now, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping, a friendly reminder that unlike me and Brian and Lindsay and Jamie down the road, you will not be on video. You, we will not be able to hear or see you, but we want you to know that you can submit questions. We want to see those questions and hear those questions. So if you have a question you want to ask Brian and Lindsay, open up the Q&A tab. It's down at the bottom of your screen and type that question in and submit it. As always, we would love to know where you are tuning in from. So when you submit your question, please be sure to let us know where you're watching this event from as well. And if you see a question you want to hear the answer to, be sure to give it a thumbs up and it will go towards the top of the Q&A tab. To turn on the closed captioning feature, click on live transcript there at the bottom of your screen. Two transcript options will pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle option to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen, but you can also select full transcript. When you do that, a sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. And bear in mind, as always with closed captioning, it might be slightly delayed. All right, without further ado, allow me to welcome Brian O'Donovan and Lindsay O'Donovan to our event. Brian hails from Ireland, emigrated to the United States in 1980, and has had a varied career path that spans professional sports, large-scale facility and event management, fundraising, and yes, public broadcasting. He has served as the general manager of Foxborough Stadium, yeah, that stadium, vice president of the New England Patriots, founding GM and COO of the New England Revolution, who are having a phenomenal year this year, and producer and host of A Celtic Sojourn on GBH. His wife is Lindsay, grew up in Newton. They have been married for 40 years. They have a, a lovely uh, story on how they met and got together 40 years ago. Maybe they'll share that. They have four grown children, two grandchildren living in Cambridge and uh, are joining us from there. Welcome, Brian and Lindsay. Good to see you. Great to be with you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. We're delighted to be with you as well. Thanks for the nice introduction. The revolution were doing well, by the way, but they lost in penalty kicks. On... Oh no, that's heartbreaking. Oh, I'm so sorry. Because they've had such a great, they had such a great season. Actually, the best in MLS history. They won more games, but yeah, wasn't if, this year. If they had you, you know, they would have made it. The <laughs> Um, so we're going to be talking about different traditions, Celtic traditions, as well as your personal family traditions. I think we should uh, start things off with just talking a little bit. What is a specifically uh, Irish or Celtic tradition for this time of year versus, you know, American traditions? Well, I think essentially for us growing up in Ireland, Christmas was a very important time of the year. Uh, largely based on the fact that people slowed down and got together with each other and visited families. And it's a time of slowness that I really missed when I came here first, Chris. When, when I came here first, I remember how amazed I was that the day after Christmas, people went back to work, which is not the case at all in Ireland. Christmas extends from, you know, essentially Christmas Eve through New Year's. Mm -hmm. Nothing is done. You can't get anything done during that period because people just slow down take time to be with each other. They often visit in each other's houses, drive to visit uh, relatives, kids finding their own uh, ways to play in the streets. There's lots of traditions around that. Um, but it's a slower period that I really missed here. Um, not as commercial, of course, things have changed over there as, as well. But again, when I was growing up, it wasn't as commercial. And it was just a wonderful time just to kind of hang out and be with other people. And that was the main tradition in itself. But there were, then other traditions around, for example, lighting candles in the window. Uh, the youngest would light a candle and put it in the window of white, a, white a white candle specifically, because 
the Irish basically believed that the, the Holy Family were wandering the roads on Christmas Eve. And so the, it, was a, it was a welcome tradition to put the candle in the window. And that's something that has passed over here as well as we do it now. And it's just a lovely tradition. And then Christmas Day itself, of course, it was, it was and still continues to be a, a, mostly a Catholic country, though much less so dominated now than it was uh, back then. So going to mass was very, very important to us in the morning. And that's where we would uh, hear Christmas cards. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were more Christmas cards. Lindsay knows more about this because she's a church musician. There were more Christmas cards sung on Christmas morning because the Catholics don't really do much. Until... No, um, I grew up in a, a Protestant tradition where we were singing Christmas carols um, starting the first Sunday of Advent. So I have a very rich background of um, Christmas carols and part of my culture. Um, so it, it was really surprising to me um, visiting Ireland um, that they don't do any Christmas carols till Christmas Day, which um, seemed you know, unusual to me, but it's just part of their tradition. The Protestants were always better singers than they us. They are. They yeah. always will be. <laughs> they sang in harmony and they sang more exotic songs. We were confined to just a few Christmas songs, but they were really wonderful on Christmas morning. Very evocative of my memories now in a beautiful church in my hometown of Clannacilty, a tiny little town on the coast of, of West Cork. And then there was a tradition on what we call St. Stephen's Day, the Feast of Stephen, which is basically the uh, 26th of December, the day after Christmas. And there was a tradition that was based in some sort of pagan provenance of hunting the wren. And the wren was a symbol of winter. So it was, it was kind of a ritual that symbolized the death of winter. And we would, I mean, the original days, they would get an actual wren and, and put put the, 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 the wren in a bush and, and go from door to door singing and like it was a tradition like wassailing in in, uh, in England, uh, where you would go from door to door looking for essentially free drink, I suppose, and an excuse to have a party. And that was called singing the wren. In my area of the country, we called it singing the ran for some reason. The, the wren became ran. And um, interestingly, that was very strong when I was growing up, seemed to die out a little bit, and now is back stronger than ever, being revived particularly in my area of West Cork and even more strongly in County Kerry. And uh, that's, that's, that's really a, a tradition that continues to this very day. Brian, can you tell them about, um, I'm just remembering this as we're talking about a wonderful tradition in Clonakilty where you go caroling, um, collect oh, yeah. money um, to buy little sweets and things and um, they're all delivered. Then they go back, the carolers go back to the what's called the county hospital. I'm not sure what it's called today. It's and, um, an, it's an, sing carols again on- An old folks home, basically. Which we were lucky to be able to do with our family back in 2010. Yeah, it was very, yeah. very special. That was a tradition in our town. And um, I think that's gonna be revived as well. Just, just basically the children of the town kind of giving back to the community and bringing some cheer. How much of that do you bring into the, sh how much of that tradition that you grew up with, both of you, I suppose, um, has found its way into what a Christmas Celtic Sojourn is as, as the program that so many people uh, make now part of their holiday tradition? Well, I think essentially what it is, we, we don't try to do anything that's kind of manufactured. We, 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 what we try to do is, is, is what I say about Christmas Celtic Sojourn is that it really isn't a concert with an audience. It's more like a, a gathering with everybody participating in the play. And we had a tradition especially in our tradition in Newton uh, under Lindsay's guidance of having a, two huge Christmas parties. One was oriented towards children. It was a children's Christmas party where we would invite all of our kids' friends, probably what, about 30? Oh, yeah, no, well. I mean, there could have been 30 at any given time. <laughs> and then the other one is, was an adult party, which was, which was uh, Christmas cards. Well, the children's party was just a, a wonderful tradition um, where there weren't never 30 children, <laughs> but um, where we would See, gather, like me. we would gather in front of the fireplace. We had a big old house with uh, two fireplaces and um, Brian, would, Brian would be in front of the fireplace reading out loud to all these children dressed in little Christmas outfits. And um, one of the favorite stories, which we did actually incorporate into Christmas Celtic Sojourn with the little Harney dancers was a wonderful story, fa family favorite called The Puppy Who Wanted a Boy. And it's still to this day is one of my favorite Christmas stories. And um, it was asked for every year. And 
we we had friends that we who grew up and are now like living in the west coast and they still like remember fondly puppy who wanted a boy and um yeah so it's, it's one of those little things that kind of morphed into christmas celtic backstage <laughs> absolutely but 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 it, again what lindsay's saying is just the, the atmosphere and the momentum the impetus really for creating a christmas celtic soldier comes from those family traditions and that's what we wanted to bring to the stage and the only difference is we did it with very very talented musicians and dancers so it's kind of a high level good old-fashioned kitchen kitchen party and that's what people i think get the atmosphere from we, we 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 try to engender that each and every year and this year we're back yeah it's hard not to have uh seamus egan at your christmas party that's uh that's a pretty that's a pretty incredible uh, oh no chris we have had for the very first few years that we were having our party for several years in newton um one of the people that we kind of got the party going with with the carol singing was Robbie O'Connell and his wife Roxanne, who did this beautiful um, needlepoint in the in the mantle behind us of Joyeux Noël, and we would have this gathering where we had two sets of carol singing books. The red one was for the people who only like sing once a year, and the black one, if you were actually walking around the living room with the black book, people knew that you were a singer because these were all this is for German. you, Chris. German and French carols in four part harmony. <laughs> so these were the carols. You really needed to know what you were doing for this. But um, Robbie O'Connell was often there and would sing on um, Christmas in the trenches in the wee hours of the morning when we were all sitting in front of the fireplace on the floor. Uh, great yeah. memory. Wow. That's great beautiful. Memory. Well, uh, with carols in mind, uh, Leslie uh, just left a question that has been upvoted here a couple of times. Are there some typical Christmas carols or songs in Ireland that always get sung every year that really remind you in particular of Irish, uh, Irish question, uh, Irish uh, traditions. Yeah, there are, there are a few differently. Uh, interestingly, not as many songs that are actually Irish themselves, but there are a few. There's a beautiful one called the Kerry Christmas Carol, which actually recounts that exact uh, tradition. I talked about the Holy Family um, wandering around looking for shelter on Christmas Eve. And uh, that 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 does that about lighting Sean the candle Keen in the wind. Sean Keane, who was ago. a great singer from Galway, came and visited us, and he brought that song yeah, to absolutely. us. Absolutely. And a variant of it is another song called the Queen in the Nangle, which is the lights of the candle in the window in the Irish language. And we're in Nick Owley who sings that in yeah. Kerry. And the Wexford Carol. And the Wexford Carol is another one. Adish mm. Kennedy has a beautiful carol that her, her parents wrote in the Irish language. It was featured in uh, our Christmas Celtic Sojourn a virtual edition last year uh, recorded in her beautiful pub in the middle of Dingle. And um, the Wexford Carol, there is a uh, there's a tradition in, in, in Wexford in a place called Kylemore Quay, where the Normans would have landed, a very French influenced uh, area of the country. And they have a sequence of carols, like lessons and carols, uh, called uh, the Kylemore uh, Carols. And the Wexford Carol, though not one of them, is very much like that. And that has been recorded by Yo-Yo Ma and Alison mm. Krauss. And, you know, um, it is a, a very, very well-known Irish Christmas carol, one of the traditional ones. Are there, you know, with that in mind, I think we, we tend to have a, a, a very mystical uh, impression of Celtic traditions for them being so old and also being transitioning from pagan tra uh, traditions into Christian traditions. And Carolyn has a question. She's an Andover. She says, are there any obvious leftovers of those very early beliefs of solstices and so forth that find their way into Irish traditions? Very, very much so, Carol. I mean, I mean, essentially what the, what the what the early Christians did very cleverly to spread the new gospel was they co-opted existing traditions all over Europe. They didn't go in and say, you can't continue to do what you do because we've got a new one. They basically went there and essentially simplifying it here, but they just said, we have a new God. We have somebody who is, you know, preaching love and equality and, and, and is light in this darkness. And, uh, you know, we will superimpose it. So essentially the, the birth, the, the birth of, of Jesus is a, a triumph of light over darkness that was superimposed on the solstice on on the existing pagan traditions and if you think of it lighting lighting fires getting light into the house to begin with very important mm. they used evergreens that's where the christmas tree comes from it reminds people in the darkness of the winter when everything around us is dead 
that there is in fact real life in the vegetation or the greenness of, of, of evergreens. And, and those types of traditions, gathering with friends and family to say, okay, we've survived another winter. From this day on, the days are actually, even though it's midwinter, the days are actually getting slightly longer every day. If we can survive this, as Seamus Heaney says, if we can, if we can uh, winter, if we can survive the winter here, we can summer anywhere. And that was really the, um, the, the position of those folks and, and it incorporated very smoothly into, into Christian traditions and, 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 and still does today. It's funny, we, 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 you know, we're pretty far north here in the United States, but we're still south of where Ireland is. So it must be incredibly dark in the winter there very okay. early on. Very, very, very little sunlight. Um, it can be, um, it can be, you know, a lot of heavy cloud. Um, there's a reason why we, we, uh, we want to sing it and dance and maybe, maybe go to the pub at five o'clock occasionally because it's pitch dark and it's a, it's a good it's like midnight. To your friends. Exactly. Uh, we have a question here from Tanya and Franklin who um, wants to know if there are differences between the different Celtic traditions. So Irish versus Scottish versus Welsh. Yeah, if you want to talk about Slytherin, yeah, no, the, one yeah, no, it's true. But there are tra there are different traditions in those countries. They're they're related. The Irish and the Scottish are more related to each other, except the Scottish. Focus and a lot I, on New York. Yeah, as well, I never, I never, well understood. I never, I never actually got the origins. I bet there's somebody that knows much more about this than than I do. It tells why the the festival of Hogmanay they call it, mm. which is essentially New Year's. That's why the traditions around Auld Lang Syne, for example, a Robert Burns poem sung at New Year's, but Hogmanay, you've experienced it firsthand, mm -hmm. and we, Scotland, we really incorporated great. some of this into the show as well, but it's, uh, tell us about first footing, what, ha what happens? Well, first footing, they just go around with- This is New Year's Eve, Yeah, right? New Year's Eve, like, no, after- the, Yeah, after, after midnight, midnight on New Year's in They in go Scotland. first footing to people's houses, like, I, I, I think it's, I, I, oh my gosh, I'm not really sure of the tradition, but, um, if they go around and kind of welcome in the new year, visit, each, visit other. each other, like starting. Yeah, they're welcomed across the threshold, right? You welcome exactly. someone exactly. in and then move on lovely. to the I think that's why they call it first footing. Yeah. And um, and they, there's traditions where they bring a lump of coal and a wee dram of whiskey with them. And again, I think uh, in, in, a, in, in a kind of the desire for our society these days, technologically advanced and everything else is happening, and particularly against the backdrop of a pandemic, People want to revive these traditions. They recognize the human quality, the human nature, and why they existed to begin with. And whereas in maybe the 1980s, uh, you know, they were kind of regarded as old fashioned and quaint and not necessary. I think their importance in people's lives are, is being underscored again right now. So long may it be the case. I agree with that. Um... Lindsay, I know you were talking about having a caroling tradition uh, earlier and um, in your family, and that has tradition transitioned into an O'Donovan caroling tradition yeah. that goes throughout the Advent season. Do you can you give us your top three? My top carols. Carols. Oh my goodness! Oh, you're gonna have to. I was um, gonna give you. I was gonna give you number one, but I figured three was kind okay. of. Okay. Um. Well, I mean, I, one of my top ones is um Vakat Aus which is one of the ones in the Black Book, of course. Um, and another She's one- showing off. <laughs> <laughs> another one is actually, I think it's the, um, it's a different version of um, a little town of Bethlehem. It's not the one that's traditionally sung here, but it's actually traditionally sung in the UK and in Ireland. Is it the one that goes, oh, little town yep, of that's Bethlehem. It. Um, yeah, it's one of my favorites. And then another rather obscure one that I grew up with, um, it written in um, Germany in 1659 called A Babe Within the Cradle on Kindlein ein Geboren. Um, John McCormack actually recorded it. Yeah. She was playing it for me last night, and I don't think I'd heard it before. But the oh. great, the great Irish tenor John McCormack sang a translation of it, mm. and it's absolutely exquisite. In yeah. fact, I'm going to play it on my show on Saturday. But my favorite one, Chris, is Low Hour Rose. Oh, we that's often, another one you know, that one of my mm. that. So I've got four. I mean, I could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could keep going. To, Coventry yeah. Carol is mine. Yeah. Uh, I could 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 listen to that all day. Well, with, with that in mind, uh, Mark in Atlanta, Georgia is joining us. Thanks, Mark. Um, and he asks, do carols differ from county to county, north to south, as dialects do? That is a great question. I'm, I know that there are definitely traditions. We already talked about Wexford. 
Uh, interestingly, in actual fact, there are there is not. I mean, this might disappoint some of the, the, <laughs> the viewers out there. There is not as much Christmas music in Ireland as you would think there should be, based on what I just said. So they've incorporated a lot of the English Christmas carols in, and I think Lindsay's point about the Catholic right basically says you shouldn't sing Christmas exactly. So I, I actually Advent songs, right? I work in the Catholic Church. It's just but my whole career as a church musician. Is this may, may or may not be an impact on it. Then in the Catholic Church, so I I learned that Christmas carols are only sung for a very short window between Christmas Eve and Epiphany. So therefore, if someone goes to mass in Ireland or anywhere else on Christmas, they'll hear Christmas carols and then. If the following week they don't go, they don't hear it again for another full year. So that might have impacted. I have, think it's mm. probably impacted the, the fact that although they love the Christmas carols, they love them, but they're just it's not as it's not as part big a part of their culture. Yeah. I think in, in the Catholic tradition there, and of course the country is mostly Catholic. So um I think, yeah. Yeah, well, and I think that, I mean, my family being German, we have, I think you have an advent calendar there, exactly. you know, the you German do. tradition yeah. of the Christmas tree. And, and yeah, my mom has made all of us one of those uh, exact thing. Every day you hang something up and. Um, oh my God, my, our kids used to, this used to be at the bottom of our stairs when we lived in Newton when the kids were growing up and they would, <laughs> it would get them out of bed in the morning, actually, because they would tear down the stairs. To all be the four first of them to see who could get, get down there in time. To so that it. was very important uh, in, in our family growing up. And now you've got one of those for each of the kids, you yeah. know, the, the grandchildren are beginning to, well, one, the one that's conscious enough, she's four years old. So she's beginning to use an advent calendar. Yep. Do you, um, we've been talking about music mostly, but are there food traditions that you stick to? Well, uh, yes. I mean, in, in Ireland, there are food traditions. Ireland's a very traditional uh, uh, Christmas dinner is turkey and mm. stuffing. And as Dylan Thomas says, turkey and blazing pudding. Ham. And uh, turkey and ham, actually. And uh, thyme is a, is a spice that was very much used. We grew up not with the nouvelle cuisine that's in Ireland at the moment. We grew up with very plain cooking. And my dad actually was a butcher, so we had access to... To, to meet at all times, but it was ra rather plain, rather simple. But, but Christmas gave us a chance for slight exoticism. And that, that meant that we used thyme or spices <laughs> like that. And, and, and Christmas trifle. You're and always, trifle always is, yes, a, a sherry trifle is something that we always had. Mm. Pretty much oranges. only at Christmas. Uh, Cadbury. Chocolate Cadbury's, chocolate oranges, candy was a big part of what we did. White lemonade for some reason and, and biscuits, tins of biscuits called USA biscuits. That was the very <laughs> of what we did. They were called, I, I think, stamped like USA as if that was an important tin of biscuits. And we would get those things and maybe boxes of chocolates for Christmas when we didn't have them at other times of the year. Oh, you had always had um, Brian's sister, Carmel, is kind of the um, Christmas pudding maker of his family. And um, plum, pudding. plum pudding, it's, I guess, called in she makes them every year for everyone in the family and Sends now is making them with her grandchildren. And um, she posts them off. I mean, she's posted them to family members in the Bahamas, in Australia. And families have different recipes for that plum pudding, but it's- Does a, anyone have caramels? I don't know. Oh, I, I don't think know. She, keeps it, she keeps it preserved. And sometimes you cover it with brandy and flame it. So that's like, you know- <laughs> so That's a real tradition. I mean, they don't really bear that is, and they make a Christmas cake as well that's covered with that's um, not that fruit the fruit cake the that's fruit cake that, covered with marzipan and whoa. this unbelievably deliciously hard white icing and then they little christmas trees and christmas trees and baubles on it and sometimes you have to get in order to get to the fruit cake you kind of have to use a jackhammer you know? <laughs> 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 well i know where i'm going for christmas it actually it actually <laughs> it preserves the uh, the fruit cake inside it so you can actually have the, somebody uh, robbie o'connell used to say that the best christmas cake that he had he would actually use a, a screwdriver to get at it at easter time and it was like this moist <laughs> fruit cake inside it but the marzipan and this hard icing wow definitely um definitely a, a factor well it's a workout um it's we have um so that question came in part from diane and in part from uh kevin kevin uh listening along does it say here kevin no it doesn't um but patricia i imagine you're going to be talking about this a little bit on Saturday, but 
Um, she has any any Irish Christmas Carol CDs that you that you might recommend, Brian? Yes, well, we've got a few ourselves actually, and there's there's some beautiful ones uh, of a Christmas Celtic sojourn. CDs are tough these days, Chris, as you know. It's sometimes it's hard. Like if, if somebody gave us a CD and they do, I have CD players at work that I use, but here we don't have one. Got a new car recently. There's no CD player in it. Mm. So I would be glad. I recommend CDs actually, and we are creating a holiday play, a Celtic playlist. So if anybody's out there right now uh, watching and wants to get in on our holiday playlist, which you can play on your computer or your phone, just send me an email, celtic at gbh.org, and I'll send you recommendations. That's celtic with a C at gbh.org, and just put Christmas recommendations in the subject line, and I'll send you that. Chris, back at you, though. Um, CRB and GBH Music is putting together a whole set of resources of holiday music and CRB where Chris Boss works every day has put together three separate classical playlists for Christmas. That mm -hmm. is absolutely splendid. And again, send me that email and I'll connect the link for you. That's Celtic at gbh.org. Put Christmas in the subject line and I'll send it right off to you. And Hanukkah I think we'll put it there in the chat as well. The, yes, the, absolutely. The and Hanukkah Castle, who's a close friend of ours and a well-known fiddler, just came out with an ex exquisite, exquisite one. It's called Oh Come Emmanuel. It's one of the more beautiful mm. Christmas albums It's ever. Just, just out, Hanukkah Castle. And our, our son-in-law has a, well, that's not a Celtic one. Actually. No, yeah, The Knights is called it. The Knights a, of a beautiful one. But Kate, Ro Kate Roseby has a beautiful winter album as well that I remember from a few years back, yeah. Yeah, there are several out there. So, sorry for the light changing here. It's a cloudy day and it's <laughs> a sunny, sunny place here, but... Um, it, it's real, I suppose, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what is, uh, Mary is uh, asking about a tradition, American traditions that you would never see in our Ireland. What is, what, what are one of the things perhaps that you've been sort of surprised by uh, now that you've lived here for X number of years? Well, I, I think, I think, um, not no turkey at Christmas. Yeah, no, the, 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 we've had the enough idea, of turkey. Exactly. The, the Americans had enough of turkey at that stage because turkey was the transit, was the um, traditional Thanksgiving meal. And I remember my sister coming to visit me from the Bahamas, the two of us for the very first time. It was 1980. In fact, yeah. it was the same time I met Lindsay and my sister Millie. Uh, we called her Mildred. She came from the, she lives in Nassau in the Bahamas and she came and visited us. And we went to a friend's house for dinner and they served us roast beef. And my sister nearly had a heart attack. I mean, like, it was like, what is this? How could this possibly have happened? And it wasn't she, my house. She felt no. so <laughs> surprised, I think. that Although we didn't have turkey. That we actually ended up going out and getting a turkey and just putting it in just so that we could say it was a real Christmas. So that was a very surprising thing for us. Mm. And, um, and probably the other tradition here, which is unfortunately a tradition, is that everyone is literally back in the saddle at work on the 26th of December so that we morning. Missed, that was a huge adjustment. Huge yeah. adjustment, exactly. We, we actually didn't go to work and no. we went, we went singing, singing the rain. <laughs> uh, we nearly got arrested a few times doing that. <laughs> it's not a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> uh, Leslie has a question here that says, do people still go humming? I don't know what that is. Humming. Okay. Humming. Um, I'm not too sure what, what she means. She might, she might clarify it if that's okay, Leslie. If Perhaps. Well, uh, we've talked about Boxing Day a little bit. You call it St. Stephen's Day, similar yeah. traditions on that day. Um, we have a question here about um, whether you're going to do any more GBH uh, uh, learning tours, Celtic learning tours out over in Ireland. We most certainly are. In fact, we're organizing those right now. Obviously, in this in this set of circumstances, we need to be um, very conscious of the fact that we will only do learning tours when it's absolutely safe to do so. Mm. And I think we're heading in that direction in spite of the trepidation that's there. All of the, my indications is that we will be starting up again. In fact, we have one planned for October in Scotland, but of course have not put it out there officially yet pending just a little bit more developments exactly. over the next month or so on, on what's happening. Well, again, if people are interested in our learning tours, we're going to expand them. Lindsay's getting very much more involved with me. Smaller tours, we're going to go to Brittany, we're going to go to Cornwall, we're going to go to Galicia in, in Northern Spain, which of course is now increasingly recognized as a Celtic country. And um, we're, we're going to do a lot of touring in the next few years. And I think people are not putting off the opportunity for those experiences, Chris. You know, uh, I, it's been brought to my attention that despite being somebody who professionally reads, 
uh, I read humming instead of mumming. Do people still go mumming as in the mummers? I put an H in there. Oh, that's a great question. And there <laughs> are mumming traditions in Ireland as well. Uh, they come from England, I would say. Their origins are more in England, but there are mumming traditions and um, uh, they, they do it very much again in, in West Kerry. It, they're called straw boys and they dress up in straw outfits often it would have been originally in disguise, draw straw skirts and hats of a particular shape and size. And those mummers go uh, from house to house. And there are in unique aspects of those mumming traditions peculiar to various parts of each county. Mm. And um, for example, in Cork, what would be? I think Cork was actually more like the straw boys, was more like the um, straw boys of Kerry. Mm. Um, and in Northern Ireland, they're quite different as well and would come from the Scots-Irish, the Presbyterian traditions that they brought over with them. And also just, there's a lot of commonality between English traditions and Irish traditions. They just come up in, in various uh, forms. Um, but, yeah, but definitely, again, like these old traditions, which I'm, I'm encouraged by, are coming back. They're beginning to be researched and their value, as I said, as rituals are being recognized more and more, even in mm. modern societies. The um, we're going to have one more question here, and then we're going to bring uh, Jamie in uh, to just tell the audience a little bit more about GBH and what's going on here. Jamie is actually the person who's responsible for me having my job, so it's always good to see Jamie. Um, but uh, what uh, Brian, uh, hold on, oh Jeffrey, Jeffrey uh, asked about the Christmas Celtic Surgeon this year. Where can we see it? What are the dates? And uh, yeah, if you maybe could talk just a little bit more about, about the show sure. itself. Yeah, just a little bit of a, uh, just a little bit of a kind of a synopsis here is that we obviously couldn't have a Christmas Celtic Sojourn last year. We were like all the theaters all around the world kind of shut down. Uh, but we did create a virtual one where a group of us got together quarantined in Rockport and created a very, very special um, experience for all of us and indeed the audience. Some like 7,600 people joined us for that. So this year we wanted to continue that and we will, but we're also back in the theaters. We've got five shows at the Cutler Majestic Theater, a very, very safe theater, working very hard with everybody to make sure VAX is required um, and all of the CDC guidance will be followed. But we believe it's important to get back into the theaters in as safe an environment as we can create and remind ourselves of our humanity. And I think this Christmas, even more important than ever. So still some tickets available for that. We also will be in Rockport, but those two shows have sold out many, many, many weeks ago. And then um, the virtual is going to be of the live, if you know what I mean. You will be able to enjoy the beautiful Cut the Majestic Theater, but from the comfort of your own home and see or join or share with a friend or a family member, a Christmas Celtic Sojourn on your big screen TV, on your computer, on your phone, wherever it is. We're sp spending a lot of time developing that. All that information, Chris, and uh, mm -hmm. folks watching us, is at Christmas Celtic, just, just one word, christmasceltic.com. Christmasceltic.com. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to take a moment here and, uh, and welcome in uh, Jamie. We have so many great questions and some more questions to get to once Jamie has, has spoken to us a little bit. But uh, for the moment, welcome, Jamie. Thank you, Chris. And uh, welcome, everyone. I am so glad to be with you during today's Ask the Expert event, featuring not one, but two of my favorite radio hosts, Chris Foss and the Brian O'Donovan. So today's event is made possible by the ongoing support of viewers and listeners like you. And for that, we thank you. Whether convening virtually, online, or via broadcast, GBH programs and events offer topics that engage, enlighten, and inspire. If you enjoyed today's event, then please make a donation so we may continue providing free events to the community. Today, when you show your support with a donation of $150 or $12.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, we will thank you with a pair of tickets to a attend a live performance of A Christmas Celtic Sojourn on Sunday, December 19th at 5 p.m. at Boston's Cutler Majestic Theater. This is your opportunity to experience the excitement of a live show again. And this show is gonna feature the Celtic world's best performers. Or you may decide to give these tickets to a friend or a loved one. Really, the choice is yours. 
You'll find these tickets and other special thank you gift options when you visit gbh.org, excuse me, everybody, it's gbh.org slash support events. Giving is simple and it's secure. Just click the link that you see in the chat tab now, or you can text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811, or you can scan the QR code behind me, up oh, on this side, this QR code over here, and it will lead you directly to our donation page. If you're already a GBH member, we thank you so much for your support, not just during the holidays, but throughout the year. And it's your support that makes GBH and Celtic programming like this possible. Uh, so thanks, that's my message. We hope to hear from you all. And uh, now back to the show and my two favorite radio hosts. Thanks, Jamie. And I have to, I have to second what Jamie says because we at, at CRB are currently also in our winter membership drive and it, it is incredible the support that uh, listeners and viewers of GBH and CRB in particular uh, give and allow us to do all sorts of incredible things, including having Celtic Sojourn on GBH. So thank you very much for, for supporting GBH and CRB. And uh, if you haven't yet, thanks for considering doing so, because uh, it, it really it really means a lot. Um, we're going to go back to some questions. You guys ready for some more questions? Absolutely. I love it. Um, Susie has a question here about within your household, are there any traditional gifts exchanged, especially on Christmas Eve for children? She says, we always uh, opened up pajamas on Christmas Eve, she says, and other families have other traditions uh, like that. Do you have anything like that amongst your, your growing family? Yes, as a matter of fact, we do have one and it's right here, um, Christmas Eve, I don't know if you can see this. Mm. Polar Express. The Polar Express. Um, I think I got this when our oldest daughter, Ito, was maybe three, three years old, and um, Brian read it. That was our Christmas Eve tradition. I would typically often be working at a church and then get home, and um, we would do the Polar Express in front of We always lived somewhere with a fireplace, like for our entire 40 years, um, and we'd always sit in front of the fire, um, make s'mores, um, and that we would do Polar Express. And then as the kids, and then Brian would read uh, the Dickens. Uh, no, Charles, that, Christmas, Charles and, Christmas and Wales. We would listen to it, the older kids would. You and know. then eventually he'd start reading that to them. You know, the ones that were old enough of the four to stay up later, got to hear Charles and Christmas Wales. The younger ones would go to bed after Polar Express. And um, they were only allowed to have Polar Express actually on Christmas Eve and our son Aiden once went to the school library at, his, at the elementary school and frantically was trying to get Polar Express and he said I'm never allowed to read this and the Any librarian had no idea what that was all about it was only it was a Christmas Eve special thing for our kids. Also the youngest basically put the angel on top of the tree. Exactly. That was, um, a, that was always a- uh, Now and, it's Bryant. And, and it's, <laughs> yeah, because we're, we don't have the youngest with us. Uh, we will this year actually, we'll have the grandchildren yes, we with will. us. But uh, those types of small traditions, lighting a Christmas candle and of course leaving- um, Cookies the, for Santa. Cookies for Santa, but being Irish, we actually didn't leave milk and cookies. We left actually a glass of whiskey. <laughs> Santa. And of I'm course, sure we appreciated that. <laughs> and of course, uh, yeah, and I uh, raw carrots followed by a shot of whiskey was certainly my good night uh, snack <laughs> on my way to bed. After, after it works, Chris, I, I highly recommend it. Why raw carrots? Oh, <laughs> that's for the reindeer. Exactly, but I, I got to share them a little bit when, Another. just before the reindeers came. <laughs> uh, another tradition that we had always at our Christmas caroling party actually was the 12 mm. days of Christmas. Lindsay's father started this tradition where he would divide the whole room each to take a day of Christmas. And eventually- My cousin in California, Sabrina, made these beautiful watercolors as a gift to my dad, um, probably back in the early 1980s. And I had them laminated because they're so precious. And uh -huh. we would have this room full of people and my dad would climb up on a chair even until he's like 80 years old and conduct this. And um, everyone in the group would like grab one of the 12 days of Christmas. And um, it was a, also a tradition, that way of doing it, we got from our friend, Stephen Michelle, 
um, their mom's Christmas party of these cards, and then Sabrina made them. And um, we this took is, these. Chris, Chris, you would you would be amongst the people getting five golden rings. Yeah, I the will, top, I'll happily the do top that. singers always got the five golden rings. But we used um, our kids would have um, memories of taking these twelve days of Christmas um, to carol with brownie troops and stuff. We would always go to old folks' home and um, mm. and do this with elderly people and. It was really interesting to see people who maybe had some form of dementia and they had four or five little kids with them and they were doing like nine ladies dancing. They, get, they could they they get, get so into it. And yeah. um, <laughs> music, it's been mu fun. music is therapy as we as we know, and it's a joyous thing to do. And so we just love that tradition of the 12 days of Christmas. And um, highly recommend it actually. It's a, it's a real great icebreaker at any sort of a gathering is to split up the room, assign each of a day and then Make it competitive. Make it full, full, full body contact. Uh, yeah, <laughs> full, chair a full contact sport. I think the Boston Pops took some of that uh, tradition from you with they all did. the different they things did. that they hold up during the twelve really, days of Christmas. They do it very well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, where did this question go? Do, do, do. Uh, Gabby asks, and I, I am uh, seconding this question from Gabby. Any plans on returning to the burn at any time? I know they're doing backroom stuff again. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, for those of you, for those of you watching out there that don't know what that refers to, we do a very small concert series at the back room of the burn, very intimate, wonderful series in that gorgeous room which has, which has such spirit embedded within it. And of course, it was suspended for, for the whole period of COVID, but it is creeping back. And in fact, uh, Lunasa is going to be performing there for two shows on the 15th of December, completely sold out. Um, and there are many, many uh, artists that are coming in for, for January and February, and it's beginning to build. A lot of that, Chris, was based on groups traveling from Ireland and Scotland and was designed to be a kind of an intimate pickup gig for those groups. That whole system is a system, basically, that's going to take time to regenerate itself. There's visas involved, there are tours where those groups need to find out what venues have survived the pandemic and can they put together a tour that makes financial sense for them? But I'm beginning, I'm beginning to get optimistic that it's going to come roaring back as it can, like our learning tours when it's safe to do so. Yeah. I wonder if you have seen over the years that you've done, well, actually, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit just about the, the trajectory of a Christmas Celtic Sojourn, how that started, what the impetus was for that, and how it grew into, into something like that, that it, the tradition that it's become now? Lindsay and I already talked about our Christmas parties and Lindsay also does a lot of work in churches. So at one stage, we actually went into a church over in Emmanuel, do you remember that? And yeah. put on a little concert with a friend of ours, Mary Casey. And then I was, I'm making this long story short, but I was regularly doing an NPR national broadcast of a Christmas Celtic sojourn actually, which was uh, putting together music and poetry and sentiments of the season in a kind of a seamless whole. And that was very popular nationally. And I said, let me take this down to the stage. I think there's some resonance here, combining Robbie. it with our experience with the um, church. And Robbie O'Connell, a close friend of mine who used to live in Franklin at that time and now has moved back to Ireland and is a nephew of the Clancy brothers, he helped me put together the very first one at the Somerville Theatre in 2003. With Cherish the Ladies. With Cherish the Ladies, who came in a snowstorm and arrived at 2 o'clock. And we put on the show at 7 o'clock. And uh, it was very, very successful, sold out very quickly. The following year, we did three shows. They sold out very quickly at the Somerville Theater. And the Cutler Majestic Theater called me up and said, we have some room here because a production of A Christmas Carol had actually stopped operating. Mm. And I said, oh my goodness, that's a beautiful theater. I want to go to downtown. And that was 2005. And then the rest, as they say, is history, just the popularity of it gave us a notion that this was bringing was something that people but, wanted it yeah. to happen. And, um, and it grew from there kind of organically. And, and we feel very privileged to be a part of it. I love when things like that happen seemingly organically, that they, they are allowed time. There isn't like a big corporate anything happening. It's people genuinely coming together year after year after year. And it grows and grows in popularity. And it's a beautiful thing. That has uh, that has continued to grow. Um, I, I wanted a couple of questions here about Epiphany or Three Kings Day, January sixth. Uh, any particular tradition or the twelfth day of Christmas, if you will? Um, any particular traditions in that regard uh, for either of you, or in particular from Ireland and the Celtic? 
nations. I start first and then I'll move to Lindsay because she's got traditions as well based in her UCC congregational upbringing around the Three Kings Day or, or the Epiphany. We did because it was called Little Christmas or Women's Christmas in Ireland and, and, and is, is very much celebrated today. The idea was, of course, it's, it's Three Kings Day, mm. um, but the idea was that women who did all of the work in a, in a very paternalistic oh. society did all of the work for Christmas, keeping the family together, washing, you know, cooking the dinner, cleaning, all of that kind of stuff, that their day was Women's Christmas which is January 6th, January 6th, right? And um, January 6th is different connotations these days and that's what threw me off. Uh, but the, uh, they basically would be given the day off and they would go and celebrate with other women. And, you know, talking about a revival of tradition, Chris, it's a big day now in Ireland, again, with people saying, the heck with this, we're, we're out of here. We're, we're basically going and having our wine at, six o'clock with a bunch of other women and, and this is our night out. So th there's, that's a kind of a secular tradition, but of course it was a church day and the three kings. When we had the, 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 the stable scene in, in the church in Clonakilty, and the, the, which is very important, we used to call it the, the manger scene. And um, the three kings of course weren't in it until mm -hmm. that day. There were three statues of the kings, Caspar, Melchior and Balthazar would appear on Three Kings Day, because mm. they weren't there before, so they weren't represented. Is that the way here? Um, I, yes, it is. And Robbie O'Connell has a gorgeous song called Three Kings Came Riding from the East and um, or all on a Christmas all on morning. A Christmas morning, and he's performed it. Well, I think basically every time he's ever done Christmas Celtic Sojourn, um, that beautiful. song's been a part of it. And it's just, it's one and, of my favorite songs. And Chris, I'm saying the other thing about Three Kings Day is my, my one of my favorite poems of, of the, of the uh, season. One of my very favorite poems of the season is T.S. Eliot's The Journey of the Magi. Mm. Um, absolutely gorgeous. gorgeous. The cold coming we had of it, the very worst time of the year for a journey and such a long journey, the ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter, the camels galling, sore-footed refractory lying down in the melting snow it's just absolutely beautiful it describes the whole journey of the magi and 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 it's powerful because they were wondering what they were doing why they were doing this and wondering very much t.s Eliot wonders afterwards they wonder what did they see was it a birth or a death mm. they couldn't quite figure it out extraordinarily powerful poem and based on the three kings i'm going to be reading that next and I'm just, I, he, for those who are watching along, he's been doing this all um, morning and afternoon, just like from memory, coming up with all these readings that he's that been doing over the years. And uh, it's incredible. Thank you. Uh, and also that was from June Ruth and, uh, and somebody else asked about that as well. I'm sorry that I didn't, that I didn't uh, get your name in there, but uh, thank you for the question for sure. We had somebody ask about St. Patrick as one would, but is St. Patrick part of any Christmas traditions being such a huge part of uh -huh. Irish things? No, I don't think so. I'm not too sure how well established Christmas would have been in, in Patrick's era. You know what I mean? Mm. He came as a missionary to Ireland and uh, is credited with, uh, with, with being one of the earliest to convert uh, some of the kings from their paganism. As I said, again, not so much of a conversion, but a convincing of them that this God, this new God, uh, the Christian God, was um, was was worthy of merit. We were just, you know, they were, he was just introducing them. So, but I don't think Christmas per se was established as or, or as codified. And I'm sure there are people that know far more about this than I do. But I don't think it was codified mm. into the canon as early as the fifth century. Mm. That comes uh, from Katie in uh, in Hope, Rhode Island. Thank you, Katie, for that question. And uh, we have a little bit. More. Do you have? Uh, you mentioned. Um, you mentioned the uh, the 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 uh, uh, Polar Express as as one of the readings. We've been talking about music and, and food, but are there other readings that for you are absolute musts every year this time of year? Absolutely, there are. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly poetry. Okay. I love to return to poetry, familiar poetry, and you know. Please do. <laughs> I mean. It's just, a child, Christmas in Wales oh, is something that, oh, that Christmas childhood. A Christmas childhood, yeah, by Patrick Cavanagh is a beautiful one, you know. Um, 
one side of the potato. One side of the potato pits was white with frost. How wonderful that was. How wonderful. And when we put our ears to the paling post, the music that came out was magical. My father played the melodeon outside at our gate. There were stars in the morning east and they danced to his music. Across the wild bogs, his melodeon called to linens and callans. As I pulled on my trousers in a hurry, I knew some strange thing had happened. Mm. Outside the cowhouse, my mother made the music of Milton. The light of her stable lamp was a star and the frost of Bethlehem made a twinkle. Mass going feet crunched the wafer ice on the potholes. Somebody wistfully twisted the bellows wheel. My child poet picked out the letters in gray stone, the wonder of a Christmas townland, the winking glitter of a frosty dawn. Cassiopeia was over Cassidy's hanging hill. I looked and three whin bushes rode across the horizon, three wise kings. My father played the melodeon, my mother milked the cows, and I had a prayer white like rose. a white rose pinned in the Virgin Mary's blouse. That's one of my favorite poems of Patrick Kavanaugh, and it's called A Christmas Childhood. Lindsay has other and books who, as well. What? I just have to tell a funny story about Christmas Celtic Sojourn that one year our music director, um, Maeve Gilchrist, decided to do a trivia at the cast party after the final show. So you have like 15, 16 musicians who have actually listened to Brian do this poem every single night, multiple times and for multiple rehearsals. And none of them, <laughs> none of them knew the second line of the poem. <laughs> not one, not one single Talk person. Talk about spacing out. I think there were my poems at that time. <laughs> these, these, these books said, uh, this is a beautiful book, of course, it's, it's spot, essentially, and known all over the world, but this, some of the ones have been translated into Irish, and this one, mm. Bran August and Nullag, like basically spot or Bran, uh, and, and Christmas, a really clever one. And this is one that Lindsay introduced me to years and years ago, Tasha Tudor's favorite Christmas carols. And it's beautifully it's illustrated. Beautifully illustrated, and uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Has like you know, like Christmas cards and little illustrations like this. Sorry, the sun is shining on this, but you can see it if you can get a, a hold of that. It's just an old-fashioned miscellany, if you will, and several other books as well that just had become traditional for us. The Newbury Christmas. Was Newbury something. Christmas, and another one that was a family favorite, like absolute total family favorite, is one called the Best Christmas Pageant Ever. <laughs> which we read aloud um, to our family like every night. And again, like when our kids were in high school, some of them would come downstairs and just listen and, and say, oh, under the pretense, oh, it's a little warmer down here than up in my room. I'm just going to do my homework here um, <laughs> just to sit and listen to the best Christmas pageant ever and knew every line and every word. And it was- By, by the way, if we're together on Christmas Eve, which we often are, and we are going to be this year, but our adult children, I will still read the Polar Express. Oh yeah, yeah. and Child's Christmas. Yeah. I'm jealous, I, I want to be there for that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, thing. And thank you for sharing all of these wonderful, wonderful um, traditions with, I don't know about anybody watching along right now, but I feel just sort of warmer having spent a little bit of time Oh, uh, yes. hearing everything that you have to see oh, oh absolutely it's um it's it's a real it's a real pleasure um we have a few minutes left in our time together and uh we i think jamie is going to come in here for just another quick moment and then and then i think we'll say a, a final a final farewell from from brian and Lindsay. if you've got anything else that you want to to tell us about uh you know here now's your time to think on it while jamie while Jamie talks to us a little bit. Hello, everyone. It's Jamie again from GBH's member engagement team. Uh, just reminding you that GBH remains committed to celebrating Boston's unique cultural content. We're proud to bring Brian O'Donovan and his wife, Lindsay, to you this afternoon, but we need your support to provide free virtual events like this to our music-loving audience. 
Today, when you show your support by making a one-time donation of $150 or by giving $12.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, we'll send you a pair of tickets to see a Christmas Celtic sojourn on Sunday, December 19th at 5 p.m. in Boston at the Cutler Majestic Theater. We are offering this and other thank you gifts curated for today's Ask the Expert audience. So how can you see these thank you gifts and what we have to offer? There are three ways to support GBH today. Number one, visit gbh.org slash support events, or you can text 800-204-3811 using keyword GBH to donate. Or you can scan the QR code, let's see if I do it here, the QR code here to open the donation from your smart device, the donation form that is. A reminder, you can give $12.50 a month as a GBH sustainer or a one-time gift of $150, whatever works for you and your budget. Giving to GBH just takes a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card or debit card. And since we make the process so quick and easy, those few minutes will multiply and now will become hundreds of hours of informative cultural programs and smart entertainment. Entertainment that really will warm your heart at the end, like today's did. So if you're already a GBH member, Thank you so much again for your support. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I had a great time. I hope you all did too. And thanks for supporting GBH. So now I'm gonna give it back to Chris and Brian and Lindsay. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, it, you know, I think I sort of teased this up at the beginning of the event. Um, this is a story I've heard a few times. So I think I'll wonderful story about how the two of you met. I know it has nothing to do with Christmas necessarily, but I was wondering if you wouldn't, we had somebody ask with a smiley face, how did they meet? Well, so. it got a little bit to do with it. Christmas. Actually, it happened, it happened it? at Christmas time at a Christmas party, essentially, in New so Jersey. So our, our original Christmas party used to be at my Lindsay family. has the long version, by the way. Okay. I just couldn't get the okay, no, kind of, Well, the very, I'll do the very one minute version. We, my parents always had a big Christmas Eve party. And so Brian and his sister were at that party along with multiple other friends and we sang carols. And then we went to a party a couple of days later at our dear friends, um, Steve and Michelle's house in New Jersey at her mother's house, um, at which we did 12 days of Christmas with the big cards that her mother had. And then my cousin, I told her about it and she made the cards for us. And we basically kind of just connected there and Fell in love a, and there is one story about that, Chris. And the one is that we went to the Union Oyster House, having come back from that party. And essentially, oh, being the romantic that I am, right? This is just after that party in New Jersey. So we we're going to the Union Oyster House. And the maitre d said, What name will I put this under? And and, and Lindsay Lindsay looked at me, I said, Oh, Donovan. And then I said to Lindsay, You better get used to it. And she said, Yes. <laughs> So that's my romantic story. That was that's my one D story. Not it was like based on making a reservation at the Union <laughs> Oyster House, but she did say yes, and the rest, as they say, is history. And here we are, forty years later. Forty years, years later, <laughs> and this wonderful day of uh, of questions and answers with you ahead of the uh, ahead of the Christmas holidays and part of the the holiday season. Thank you both so much for welcoming thank us you, into Chris. your home. Thank you, Chris. and yeah. Jamie. Yeah, uh, and thank you all for being here with us and for supporting GBH and Absolutely. participating and if, in this event. If, if I can say that, it's just reflecting what Jamie says, Chris, and you know this is the case as well. We feel very privileged. We're we're just kind of keepers of a public trust in our employment at GBH. It's such an important institution for the quality of life, not just here in Boston, but but around the world, obviously. But we feel particularly privileged to to have this platform, and even like this, a big shout out to to Bailey and Liz and Joshua and Peyton, all working behind the scenes here to create events like this during a time when we couldn't do otherwise. I mean, that's an amazing accomplishment and really is being driven by a determination to stay in touch with you and to connect you to each other, basically, particularly during these challenging times. Think of how important public broadcasting is to you and it certainly is to us. And again, thanks for supporting it. Yes, uh, what he said times three that is uh i couldn't have said it better myself 
but that is why he is the one and only Brian O'Donovan. Brian and Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for being here. Sorry if we didn't get to your questions, but uh, you can find out more about the Celtic Sojourn. You can email Brian at Celtic at GBH.org, especially if you want that playlist. Go to christmasceltic.com for more uh, information on the uh, tickets to go uh, see or stream the, uh, the event this year. And with that, we hope we'll see you again at the, uh, the next one of these we do. And uh, I hope you have a very happy Christmas time and a happy new year as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot.